Asia signs a trade deal. China's in it. The U.S. is not. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by UKG. Ultimate Kronos Group offers HR solutions to connect modern workforces. UKG.com. Our purpose is people. And by Hims, offering men access to licensed medical professionals online who can evaluate conditions including hair loss. Online prescriptions available if appropriate. More at forhims.com slash 2020. From Marketplace, I'm Sabri Beneshaw in for David Brancaccio. Fifteen Asia-Pacific countries have signed a major China-backed trade deal. It excludes the United States. It's called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It forms the world's largest trading bloc, covering nearly a third of the global economy. China could be a winner here. Marketplace's Nova Safo joins us now with more. Hi, Nova. Good morning, Sabri. How are you? Good. So 15 countries are in this deal. What do they get out of it? Well, it's the T word, Sabri, lower tariffs over time. Uh, analysts now say the deal overall will not make huge changes, in part because tariffs are already low between many of the participating countries, and also the deal is limited in scope. But the idea is that these countries, among them China, Australia, South Korea, Vietnam, would eventually stop taxing some of each other's exports to incentivize doing business across borders. For example, building products in factories in multiple countries. Now, the U.S. does this now with its trade deal with Mexico and Canada. The European Union does it too. This Asia-Pacific partnership would eclipse both of those alliances just with its sheer size. We're talking $26 trillion in economic output. It's the world's biggest trade agreement. The U.S. is not in this deal. In fact, mm -hmm. this deal was supposed to rival the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the U.S. was at the center of before the Trump administration pulled out of it. So what, mm -hmm. does, the, what does that mean? What does this deal achieve? Well, it's the inverse of the TPP, and we now have China at the center here. It's the second largest economy in the world, the biggest one in this pact, and it will have outsized influence. Uh, potentially could see itself having a lot of influence with the countries involved and less reliance on trade with the U.S. down the road. Marketplace's Nova Safo, thank you. You're welcome. A lot of companies have evolved over the course of the pandemic. Take Walmart, which is incidentally reporting earnings tomorrow. It is a mega retailer that has actually grown its business this year. It's turned up its e-commerce in its ongoing competition with Amazon. And now Walmart is launching Walmart Pet Services, as in pet insurance, dog walking, and pet sitting on top of the pet food and toys it already sells. Marketplace's Megan McCarty Carino has more. The increase in the number of people getting pets has been one of the few truly positive news stories this year. Oh, yes, I have a pandemic golden. He is uh, in training right now. <laughs> Dog owner Greg Portel is also a partner with Carney Consulting Firm. He says the nearly $100 billion pet market has proven to be resilient even through recessions. Consumers have really taken to pets as a way to have a little bit of luxury without really going over the top for themselves. Specialized retailers like Petco and PetSmart have dominated the market, but retailers like Walmart and Target are catching up, says analyst Mickey Chada with Moody's Investor Service. It's an attractive space to be in. And the big box stores have an advantage during the pandemic because consumers are looking for one-stop shopping. But he says specialty stores have an advantage, too. Some pet retailers have exclusive deals with pet food brands, and our fur babies can be pretty picky eaters. I'm Megan McCarty Carino for Marketplace. Let's do the numbers. The FTSE in London is up seven tenths of a percent. Dow, S&P and Nasdaq futures are up in the six tenths to one percent range with the Dow future up 283 points. The 10 year Treasury yield is at 0.896 percent. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Progressive Insurance, offering its home quote explorers so shoppers can evaluate options in one place when buying home insurance. Custom quotes and rates are available online. Learn more at Progressive.com. And by Blackline, presenting Beyond the Black, a virtual event dedicated to modern accounting and open to all finance and accounting professionals, November 17th to 19th, Blackline.com. And by X Chair, maker of the X2 Home Office Chair, with dynamic variable lumbar support, donating to Gladstone Research Institute to fight COVID-19 at xchair.com.
In a place like New York City, a lot of small businesses have struggled to keep up with the astronomically high commercial rent during the pandemic. Revenues are still far below normal, and a lot of people are worried there may be more lockdowns this winter. So businesses are and have been trying to negotiate their rents. As Camille Peterson reports, many are finding it can be a pretty arbitrary process. Since March, Joanne Kwong has been in the middle of the commercial real estate market's rigid math. I think most of the burden is falling now on kind of the lowest rung, which are the commercial tenants. Kwong is the president of Pearl Rivermart, a retailer in Manhattan. She has two open locations, but says she's still making less than half her usual revenue. Before the pandemic, Kwong was paying around $1 million in rent a year for those two locations and a warehouse. She says negotiating to try to get a break on her rent is like rolling the dice. Our situation is kind of dependent on the whims or the situation of the landlord. One of Pearl Rivermart's landlords has agreed to reduce rent. Another is demanding 100 percent of it. Kwong says Pearl Rivermart might have to leave that location. Joed Faruqi says his revenues have been down almost 60 percent during the pandemic. He owns a framing store, Rook, with three locations in Manhattan. Faruqi says one of his landlords has reduced the rent, another argues about it every month, and a third won't even entertain the idea of negotiating. I was explaining to him that every day I see a new store closing. And he's like, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, so you know that this is how it is. Why do we have to fight? But making rent negotiation less arbitrary is hard. Rachel Melter teaches urban policy at the New School. She says commercial leases tend to be long and not flexible. And the city doesn't have a consistent way of regulating commercial rents, even in normal times. It's hard to come up with something systematic in the middle of a crisis. Meltzer says right now, money would be the best equalizer. Some kind of bailout uh, just to, to support these businesses and help them pay whatever rent they have to pay. But small businesses do have some leverage. Nicola Russo is with CBRE, a real estate services firm. She says in New York City, rents are down and vacancies are up. There's not a lot of tenants lined up waiting for you know, tenant X to move out so tenant Y can move in. So if landlords don't negotiate, they may be rolling the dice too. In New York, I'm Camille Peterson for Marketplace. And I'm Sabri Beneshore with the Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media.